long time. Uh, when you look at the solutions, you might be disappointed to only see a few pages of algebra. Uh, but I think that's part of the learning experience, understanding what's important, what's not. Okay. And incidentally, the midterm is, I believe, on the 14th. So it's coming up a couple weeks. Okay. Any questions or comments? So let's uh, start a new topic today. In fact, we're going to talk about the homework. Uh, we're going to talk about this uh, folded cast code OTA. Uh, so this is kind of a laundry list of things we're going to analyze in the circuit. Uh, and uh, you can come back and look at this as we go along to see how much of this we've covered. Um, here's a schematic of the OTA. And uh, let's just draw it, redraw it here step at a time, get a better feeling for it. Okay, so it's the folded cast code. So let's actually discuss why we fold it in the first place. So by folded, we mean that the input stage is one polarity, let's say PMOS, and this goes into a cascode. So I have current sources here. And current sources here. OK, so in fact, if you look at the circuit, so here's our inputs say plus minus and then here's our outputs and it's a fully differential circuit meaning the input is differential and the output is differential okay so in some ways you can see that this circuit is is a little bit wasteful right because I've split the beautiful cascode configuration which shares current into two separate branches which means I have to supply extra current here so what's what's the idea why do we fold our cascode so again, the idea of folding it is instead of injecting our input signal at this point, right? So I could have 
So let me draw an unfolded cascode, sometimes called a telescopic amplifier. Plus, minus, again, this is our cascode bias node, and then this is the output node. So this is a regular cascode, so this is a differential cascode, sometimes known as a telescopic amplifier. And so instead of injecting the signal here, we actually fold it over and inject it over here. Okay. So what's, what's the advantage of doing that? Christian? More headroom in this case because you have less things stacked up on top of each other? Okay. Potentially we can get more output swing. That's good. So here, the, you know, these are hopefully high swing current mirrors and so we can get perhaps a little bit more swing. Uh, if we look at this circuit here, we have to not only, so we have a triple stack here, maybe even quadruple stack depending on how much impedance you need out of this current source. So headroom is, is one plus. So headroom at output as a plus. Okay. Anything else? Yes. David. Decoupling the common mode from input to output. Very good. That's actually the main reason. So we want to decouple the common mode of the input and output. Okay. So if you look at this amplifier here, as I change the input common mode, right, that changes the output common mode. And that's bad, right, because we do, don't want to have to specify that the amplifier input and com output common mode are linked, right? I, I want to use this in circuits where the output drives another input, right? And if I have to worry about the output and input common mode, right, then I have to have some level shifters, right? That's one bad thing. Of course, this the circuit as a, as I've drawn it is not going to work, right? What's wrong with this circuit as I've drawn it? What about the feedback? High gain circuits won't work without feedback. Okay. In particular, what's the problem here? Let's say I put feedback around it. DC feedback. No. That's right, the common mode feedback. So in, in this amplifier, the output node here is a very high impedance node, and the DC level of, of this is basically going to be determined by kind of current mismatches between the up and down, right? And this where it, where it actually settles is, is very difficult to determine, and it's very sensitive because it's a very high impedance node just a small mismatch in currents means this thing can rail to supply or ground, right? So we need some way to stabilize the output of this amplifier, and we do that with what's called a common mode feedback circuit. Okay, so what a common mode feedback does, and we'll discuss this in a lot more detail, but just to give you a heads up about it, is it senses the average voltage at the output, and it feeds back a signal somewhere to the input or possibly to the output of the amplifier to vary that aver average output and tries to force the average output to equal some desired common mode level. And we'll draw some examples of that and make this a lot more clear as we go forward. Okay, but one of the nice things about this amplifier is that you notice that due to this folding action, I could very easily design this so that the input common mode range is equal to the output common mode range. And so then I can directly drive other transconductance stages without worrying about level shifters and things like that. Also, to first order, you can see that as I change my common mode level here, uh, it doesn't influence the output common mode in the same way that this circuit does. In this circuit, I'm directly, if I increase this voltage and I drop voltage across here, that would increase the current in the circuit, right? And that would pull this voltage down. Of course, this is going to be a very high impedance current source, so it's going to have relatively minor influence. Um, 
In this circuit, though, as I increase, or let's say increase this voltage, I decrease this current. And this current, the difference between basically this current and this current goes into my output stage. Okay? Um, so in a sense that you could say this circuit is also pretty sensitive to changes in the combo. Not pretty sensitive, relatively insensitive because of this current source. So in that sense, I guess you could argue that these circuits are not too different. But in the sense that uh, the DC levels here are different, where here I can make the DC levels the same, that's a big advantage. Okay. Um, so how does this circuit work? I, actually, I should have that should have been the first thing I talked about. Uh, it's it's very simple. It's a CAS code. So you already know how CAS code works. Uh, if I apply differential input voltage, right, that generates some small signal current, which is GM times the differential input voltage, and this current doesn't flow into these current sources because they're high impedance, they flow into the low impedance point, which is the transistor. And from there, they just flow to the output. And the output has a very large output impedance. Let's call that RO. And so this current flows into RO, the, the output differential output impedance, and so the differential output voltage is GM R O V I D. Okay. Uh, okay. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the DC biasing of this circuit. So one one thing that's interesting is in this circuit, what I'd like to do, ideally, is have very high GM, right? and very high RO. So to get very high GM, what should I, how should I design my input stage? How should I size it and how much current should I put through it? Make it large, make the input uh, transistor large. That's right. And how about the current? Current um, can be large too. Okay, yeah. Basically, we want to put in as much current, call this I1, and make these devices large. Making these devices large, as we'll see, has several benefits. It helps the GM. It also helps matching, so we get less input noise. Uh, making the current large, uh, from a noise perspective, you know, then you have to consider V star, right? So there's actually a trade-off. Uh, but in general, you know, to get good gain out of this amplifier, we like to make I1 as large as possible. How about RO? How do we make RO large? How would you size the transistors? How would you bias up this leg? Yes. Yeah, that's right. So here, let's call this I2. We want this branch to have large channel length devices so we get high output impedance. And we also like low current to have higher output impedance as well. So, uh, so the idea is that this current here is the sum of these two currents, right? So this is I2 flowing in, and then this is this is I2 divided by 2. Well, I just called it I2. And this is I1 divided by 2. And the sum of these currents flows into here. There is a little bit of, so that, that's a little bit tricky because now let's imagine how we're actually going to build this. So how are we going to actually bias the circuit up? So let's look at a real implementation on the slide. Okay, so this current source, we use the cascode current source to get high, high impedance. That's natural. Uh, here, also, naturally, we're going to use high impedance. And over here, this naturally is going to form high impedance also uh, at the output. And so kind of get everything we want. Uh, if you're 
a little more aggressive, you could use longer channel length devices instead of 0.35. You know, in this technology, which is 0.35, you might go to half a micron. Uh, you bias it up with a high, sw high swing uh, sources. And if you, so now when you, you, when you program up these bias currents, you have to be a little bit careful. So here, I'm going to explicitly program this current Actually, no, if you look at this circuit, this point is only tied to the comm mode feedback. And this is something we'll talk about a little bit later. So the way I'm going to bias up my input branch is as a difference of these two currents. So VB1 is fixed to give a certain value of current here and here. And the difference between these two currents will flow out of here. Okay. So because the current in the input branch is determined by the difference between two currents, we have to be kind of careful that those over process and temperature, we don't actually end up putting a grossly wrong value of current into the input stage. So when you design this, uh, this amplifier, you have to pay a little bit of attention. You don't want to be too aggressive on high, high current. So here, coming back here, let, let's just plug in some numbers. Uh, let's say I'd like to have 200 microamps here, and let's say I want 50 microamps here. Okay, so that means that this current has to be 150 microamps, and so this input stage is biased by. Uh, okay, actually, maybe a better way to look at it is that the difference between this current and this current flows here. And if this difference, if I make, if I get really aggressive, let's say instead instead of 50 microamps, if I try to go down to 10 microamps, then you can see that this difference is very small. And over process and temperature, that difference can vary, and basically not equal, could actually go negative and turn off the stage. So when you bias this up, you don't want to be too aggressive on the ratio of the input current and the output current. Typically, a ratio of 4 to 1 would be reasonable, 5 to 1. But you would check it in your process and see and make sure you can meet those constraints. Uh, of course, you have more transistors at your disposal. So you can, using common mode feedback, you can always uh, measure the output voltages and, and assure that the output transistors are on. And that, that actually does get around this, this problem somewhat. OK. Uh, Switching back to the slides here, this is nothing new. This is just this high swing bias uh, generator. And you'll notice that the way that this is applied, it's applied as a sub-circuit. So this is probably a P version. This is an N version. And so here, we designed this, uh, you know, here I've shown it with explicit values. But you would design this as a parameterized cell, keep it in your library. And any time you want to use it, you just instantiate it saves you a lot of time. OK, here is a test circuit to measure the DC gain of, of the, the amplifier. And uh, you'll, see, you'll notice that, first of all, we're using one of those balins that we discussed last lecture. So in order to generate a true differential signal, uh, we apply a single-ended signal, go through the balin, and generate a differential signal. Also, to set the input common mode range, I can just set a DC voltage on this common mode terminal. And that will, now the average voltage on both of these terminals will be equal to that common mode voltage. And then to measure the differential output voltage, I just, again, use another balin and measure this voltage. Uh, to stabilize the common mode feedback, just for simulation purposes, I can take this voltage which is the average voltage, right? It's the average voltage at the output, average DC voltage. Uh, and basically, put this into a feedback loop. So this common mode feedback circuit compares the output to this desired output. We want it to be about mid-rail to get the best swing out of it. And then we vary the input current, which is that terminal here. We vary this current source so that the b current balance between this and this produces exactly 1.5 volts at the output. 
So if this is this is a way to do the common mode feedback just for simulation. In reality, we would not implement it this way because again, we don't have valence. All right. So here's uh, some some sweeps. This is the basically the drain current versus the uh, overdrive voltage. Um, so this is probably a more interesting plot to look at. This is the gain. Uh, the first curve here is the small signal gain as a function of the DC level of the output. And you can see that it has a pretty pretty reasonable gain of over 200 uh, over a reasonable output range. Uh, if you plot the large signal voltage gain, what we discussed last lecture, you can see that actually the output range is actually larger. So if you are shooting for a gain of over 200, uh, you get <clears throat> slightly more headroom than you would from the small signal gain. And remember, we, what we do care about is the large signal gain. We're going to be using this uh, amplifier not to amplify tiny little signals. We're going to use it in a feedback configuration where it's going to be settling with a large input difference voltage. So actually, it's the large voltage gain that, that we do care about. All right, so how do we increase the differential gain? Well, I think we talked about this already, uh, increasing the channel length. Uh, this, this will give us a moderate improvement in gain. And in any given technology, if you look at the output impedance of a transistor as a function of L, you find that if you back off from the minimum channel length just a little bit, you get a huge improvement in output resistance. But then after that, it kind of just saturates. Um, so if you're already using the longer channel length device of your technology, there's not much you can do by increasing L further. You know, you can't go from 0.35 to 10 micron and kill yourself. There will be stability problems too, but it's not going to help. Um, so if you want substantial improvement in the gain, you've got to do something more, more substantial. And we're already using cast, double cast codes here. Uh, probably in a low voltage supply, we're already going to be really close to the limit, uh, e even with this topology, because we have four transistors stacked uh, on our supply. And so other techniques that we've learned, gain boosting, right? We can use another amplifier to increase the output impedance even further. And if you look at this amplifier, it's actually you might even call it a single stage amplifier, or at best a two stage amplifier, right? There's the input stage, and then there's a common gate stage. So this is, we're getting our gain out of just two stages of amplification. Why not have more amplification? Why are we obsessed with just having two stages? Just add another common source stage here, you get a lot more gain, right? Why would you not be so quick to do something like that? Maybe even, maybe, you know, just run really low current and have 10 stages, right? <laughs> that, that would give you a lot of gain. Okay. Anybody want to? Uh... Yes, David. Yeah, stability? Oh. Yeah, stability. Uh, and so why is it? What, what's the issue with having multiple? I mean, maybe what? somebody else can answer this. So what's wrong? Why is it that if you have more than two gain stages, you have stability problems? Let's get somebody who hasn't answered a question in a while. So this is a good 140 question. In, in some countries, at the end of the class, you only pass if you pass the oral exam. So you stand up in front of the professor, and the professor says, Design a five-stage amplifier, and you say, ah, it's not going to work. Why? Stability. Okay, good. Why? Why is it unstable? And if you can't answer it, you fail the course. <laughs> so if you guys have taken 140, you all know the answer. Okay, I hear the mic. Yes, David. Each, addi each additional stage is going to introduce more poles, and as a result, you're going to have positive feedback uh, once the signal is inverted in, in such a way. 
Yeah, so you guys all knew the answer. So it's it's basically the non-dominant poles, right? So you have a dominant pole in your amplifier, and by the time you get basically to unity gain, if there's enough phase shift through the loop because of all these other poles, uh, and if you've got lots of stages that look more or less the same, they have non-dominant poles. Typically, where are our non-dominant poles? They're around the omega t of the device, right? Some fraction of the omega t. And so you're going to have lots of non-dominant poles, introduce a lot of phase shift, and you're going to have stability problems, OK? All right, so one more uh, quick thing about the folded cascode. I don't want to go into all the details of the calculations, because that's kind of the homework assignment. Uh, but one interesting thing, if you look at is the output impedance of this, right? We want to make this output impedance as large as possible. And this output impedance is the output impedance of the N stage in parallel with the P stage, right? So this is the N stage output impedance. This is our N stage output impedance. This is our P output stage. And they're not necessarily symmetric, right? In any given technology, the P output impedance is different from the N output impedance. So what you want to do, if you know, if you're, if this were, if you were doing a design project and you're trying to maximize the gain, you're going to go after the output stage, and you you say, okay, I've got as much current as I can on the input stage. I've made the devices as large as I can. So now the only way to get gain is to increase this output impedance. And uh, <clears throat> so how do I do that? Well, you could gain boost both stages, right? But it may turn out that you might not need to do both stages, and and the reason is that you might be inherently getting higher output impedance from one side than the other. And this is shown here in this plot. So this is the plot of just the NMOS output stage. Okay, So out here it goes into triode and has very low output impedance. Once they go into saturation, we have a pretty healthy output impedance. And then for high voltages, again, it's starting to drop. And this is the PMOS output stage. And we know that the total output impedance is the parallel combination. So it's always the, the one that's lower that dominates. So here, you can see that in this range, this PMOS device is really the limiting factor. So if we were to go after a gain boosting, probably you'd want, in this case, you probably could get away with just gain boosting the PMOS stage. And then your output impedance would be determined more or less by the NMOS stage. Okay. All right, uh, finally, here's a, a plot of, uh, this is a simulation to generate the GM of the device, you know. Remember, this is an OTA, so the GM is, is what we really care about. So what we're going to do is we're going to vary the input voltage and observe the output current, okay? And this is the kind of plot you see, uh, this characteristic uh, S-shaped curve shows that the current saturates around 200 microamps on either side. Uh, where does this current come from? What, what, what determines the level of saturation? I'll show you the, uh, the schematic. Probably not readable. But uh, if you had to guess, where is that uh, saturation current coming from? Which current source? So let's, let's draw a little picture here to understand what's going on. So I have my input stage. And what I'm doing is, let, let's assume these are ideal current sources here and here. And so what I'm doing is actually looking at, if I were to short the output, how much current could flow between these two terminals, right? So if these were ideal current sources, any difference between these 
these two branch currents has to come from where? Right? Okay, so let's walk through this. Um, there's a different color pen. So, first of all, let's let's apply a small swing, right? So, if I apply a small input, then we, we already discussed this. There'd be a differential current, and it goes into kind of the high impedance, the low impedance node, and then it flows through the output, right? So what's the largest I can make this this current? Yes, Christian. The DC value or the DC current source biasing the differential pair. That's right. So the, the the most current I can possibly generate here is if I apply a really huge swing here, right? If I really apply a large voltage at the input then one device will completely turn on and the other device will completely turn off, right? In which case all the current from this input will just flow into our circuit. Okay? And this is why if I look at the output current versus V in, we see this sharp uh, basically saturation. So circuits that exhibit this uh, are, are sometimes known as class A stages. That there is actually a maximum current uh, that can flow in, in the input stage. You could contrast that with another stage where let's say instead of, uh, instead of putting a current source here, uh, let's say that somehow we designed a current source that detected the input voltage and the larger the input voltage, differential voltage, the larger the current. So that it would always supply more current as the input got larger. Then clearly that would not saturate. And that's called a class AB input stage. And we'll, we'll discuss the advantages and disadvantages of these input stages as we go forward. Okay, okay so go, let's go back to this plot. Um, now, if this is the output current versus input voltage, then the, the transconductance is, of course, just a derivative. And so you can see that the peak transconductance occurs for a small input differential voltage. And as the input gets larger and larger, right, the slope goes to zero here, and so the transconductance is going to zero in these ranges. And so we get this uh, characteristic bell-shaped curve that represents the input transconductance for our device. One thing to note is that this is a pretty nonlinear amplifier, right? If your gain depends on the input signal, it's nonlinear, right? And so if you apply a very small signal at the input, if I apply a tiny signal that just wiggles over here, then the output would be wiggling kind of on the straight line, so it would be very linear. But if I apply a big input signal, right, if I actually have a signal that's varying considerably, then I'm going to get very nonlinear behavior. Okay? And so you might be concerned about that, right? How could you live with such a nonlinear amplifier if you're trying to build precision analog circuits? So what's what's the solution? Okay. Frank, why is it that this doesn't concern you? Okay, that's a good answer. So uh, I'll repeat your answer for the people listening on tape. Um, so Frank said that at the end of the day, you just care where the amplifier settles. And what happens when the amplifier settled? Where, on this curve, where are you operating when the amplifier settles? Um, 
Well, let me turn around and say, well, let's say we're not using in a switch capacitor application. Let's say it's a continuous time application. Okay. So you end up in the middle and why ED is zero? Because you use feedback to it. That's right. It's not a trick question. You're using feedback, right? So the feedback forces the input differential voltage to be as close to zero as possible, right? And that's right here in the middle. So the action of the feedback, right, what's the input differential voltage when the amplifier is settled? When the amplifier is settled, it's the output voltage divided by the gain. If the output voltage is a volt and you have a gain of a million, the input voltage is going to be a microvolt. So for a signal that's only a microvolt, this does indeed look very, very linear. Okay. But in the settling process, it's going to be nonlinear, right? And this is what, what Frank was saying, is that once it settles, it looks linear. But that process of settling is actually potentially going to be very nonlinear because of the saturation mechanism at the input. All right, uh, a final test. Uh, basically, here we apply an AC signal and measure the AC current. And from that, we get the output capacitance. And you can see that this amplifier has a, a substantial amount of output capacitance, about almost 0.6 uh, picofarads of capacitance. Uh, you'll also notice that at low frequency, uh, the phase shift of the output impedance is zero. That's because it looks resistive. And as you get past the, uh, the corner frequency here, the output impedance looks almost all capacitive. The phase shift is about 90 degrees, and that really dominates the output impedance. Uh, and so you can see that at low frequencies, the output capacitance is actually degenerated because it's the, the resistance part really is dominating and at high frequencies you see that full capacitance. All right, and this is the input capacitance. Uh, why is the input capacitance important? Well, somebody's got to drive this amplifier, right? And so this input capacitance is going to be the load for somebody else. Uh, you'll notice that the if you just take two-thirds of CGS, you get about 117 femtofarads. And that's this curve here. But at low frequency, the capacitance is actually quite a bit higher. And that's because of the Miller effect. And the Miller effect goes away at high frequencies. OK, this is the frequency response of the amplifier. Um, what's important when you look at this curve, of course, is that if you're designing a general purpose amplifier, let's say I'm just designing this op amp, and I'm going to use it over and over again. Uh, what would be the worst case stability? Okay. Jack? It would be the unity gain. That's right. So if I use this in unity gain configuration, that's actually the most dangerous point. So if I make sure that this amplifier is stable in unity gain configuration, then for any feedback that I apply, it will actually be stable. And that's why the gain is actually the loop gain, right? Because the feedback factor is 1. So I can just plot the gain of the amplifier. And when that crosses 0, which is unity gain, uh, at that frequency, I check how much phase I have. And you can see here the phase is about 75 degrees. That's exactly the phase margin, right? Uh, Ideal feedback, of course, you'd like to see 180 degrees. But because of the, do the dominant pole, there's phase shift. So if there had been only one pole in the circuit, the phase shift at unity gain would have been exactly 90 degrees. We see a few more degrees of phase shift, and that's due to the non-dominant poles. Okay, Where do the non-dominant poles come from in this amplifier? Okay, Just talk a little bit about the frequency response to this amplifier. First of all, where am I going to introduce my dominant pole for this amplifier? Okay. At the output, right? Naturally, because that's the highest impedance point, And I'd like to get the smallest capacitor I can. Why do I want to use the smallest capacitor I, I can get away with? It's area, right? This capacitor typically is going to be very large. And large capacitors take up a lot of area on chip. and area on chip is expensive. So I'd like to get away with using the smallest capacitor possible. 
So to, to set a dominant pole, I'm going to pick the highest impedance node and basically put a capacitor across there, and this will be my dominant pole. Okay. Questions or comments? Yes. Questions. Number one is a schematic. There's a symbol for OTA. Mm -hmm. It's a six terminal uh, symbol instead of four terminal. What's number five, number six pain? This is for the common mode feedback. Output. So, yeah, so why is this shorter? That, that's a good question. You know, this is not my schematic, so I don't know the answer. But, yeah, so I don't know what, what that is. But probably, yeah, good question. The question I have is, uh, suppose here you use PMOS input stage, input pair. How would you compare this with MMOS? Or what's the motivation to PMOS into AMOS? Yeah, we, we, <coughs> we talked about that last lecture. Um, what, one of the reasons you would use it is basically flicker noise, right? In a, in a uh, kind of in the, not the most advanced technology node, but if you go back a few generations, the flicker noise of an input PMOS stage is actually much better. So that's, that's one benefit. Um, you can also do this with an NMOS stage. There's nothing sacred about a PMOS input stage. Uh, in fact, you can do both. You can have a double input stage, so you inject one signal here and inject one signal at the top, and you effectively get the sum of the GMs. Okay? Uh, so yeah, this is the reason I drew it as a PMOS was just for illustration. There's nothing sacred about a PMOS input stage. Would have a higher gain than PMOS would. Yeah, and MOS would have a higher GM. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Bill. So, could the folding have been folded stage done with a PMOS? I'm sorry. Uh, so, the common gate stage could that have been implemented with a PMOS? Yeah. So, if you fold it, so that you know, there's, there's again, there's no reason why you have to use it in that configuration. I could fold it up. So now I'd use a PMOS. Right? So this is also a folded cascade. In fact, this is a good point to talk about the non-dominant pole. So dominant pole, boom, there it is. What about the non-dominant pole? aren't that many nodes in this circuit, right? So, <laughs> right? And we've talked about cast codes before, so I, I don't, I won't belabor the point. I think you guys all know where the non-dominant pole comes from. This is where the non-dominant pole comes from. This is a, a relatively high, uh, low impedance node because you have almost the impedance of one over GM of the, just this transistor. And then there's some parasitic capacitance sitting on this node. And this capacitance and this basically GM of this transistor produces a non-dominant pole. And luckily, uh, the, this capacitance looks like several CGSs, right? It looks like the CGS of this guy. Uh, looks like a C uh, drain to bulk of this guy. So it's, let's say, on the order of several CGSs. So the non-dominant pole should be on the order of, you know, a fraction of omega T, which is pretty good. That makes the design of this amplifier a lot easier. Uh, this is one of the reasons this amplifier is popular, is that it's a very good high-frequency amplifier. You know, Once you determine the dominant pole, all the other poles are relatively high-frequency, so it's very easy to compensate. Okay, questions or comments about that? Yes? So how could you say it's not the input node that's has the non-dominant pole? Then? Well, the reason is that the input is actually going to form a load with a previous driving stage. And so this is actually going to be part of a dominant pole of the driver stage, which is on the same order of uh, a frequency of this. If, you, if it's the first stage you're driving and you have an input impedance from the source, then 
that's a good point. Uh, so the reason that this is probably not an issue is we are voltage driving the input. And if I'm lo voltage driving the input, the low impedance on a really low pole, that's the problem. Because if you're voltage driving, you have a resistance from that, from that voltage source, a low impedance resistance. Yeah, so the RC time constant is very small, right? Because this R is very small. If I'm voltage driving it, this R is tiny. So if, if I voltage drive it, I'm already determining what the input voltage is, and this capacitance is just getting charged and discharged. So I have to have the capability to charge and discharge this cap, but it's not going to limit my frequency response. If I drive it with a high impedance, then it's an issue. That's a good question. Okay, so you guys are going to have uh, lots of fun with this circuit in the next homework. So we can move forward and, uh, and talk about some other topics. All right, so the next topic for the course is feedback. And you guys have all seen feedback before, so we're not going to teach feedback per se. We're going to kind of review it and then use it. And more specifically, we're going to focus on what's important about feedback. All right. So maybe um, just out of curiosity, how many of you guys studied feedback using the two-port analysis that's similar to what's presented in Chapter 8 of Gray and Meyer? Okay. I don't see that many hands going up. Okay, maybe. So how did the rest of you guys study feedback? What, what techniques did you use to analyze feedback? Find out what kind of feedback it is, front of series, and then find the feedback factor, and then just the gain. So right. that's kind of the two-port approach, like Gray and Meyer. But to, to Gray and Meyer, it's talk out there. You have to find whether this is Y, Z, G. We mm -hmm. just used to do, like, you know, if it is shunt shot it, if it is series, open it. And then OK. But then how do you find, let's say, the loop gain? How do you calculate the open loop gain? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the problem is that uh, it's hard to separate the feedback network from your amplifier, right? Because the feedback network loads the amplifier. And so to calculate the open loop gain, you got to somehow take that, that loading into account. Somebody else who didn't, so you guys took two, 140, yeah. How about return ratio? Okay, yeah, return ratio. That's a very popular approach, and we'll, we'll, we're, we'll review that in this class. Uh, anyone else do feedback, maybe study it a different way? So those are guys who took 140 last semester. What did you guys do? Well, they didn't cover the feedback in the 140. <laughs> okay, so you have some reviewing to do. <laughs> Um, so in this class, we'll, we'll go over feedback uh, probably a lot faster than you would in an undergrad class. But my, my goal is to give you the tools. And so you should, if you are feeling like you need to review feedback, you should be very comfortable reading, let's say, Chapter 8 of Gray and Meyer or another book and, uh, and having a very good confidence that you understand the feedback. All right, so again, I'm not going to show you this. This is ideal feedback. And w what is interesting about the ideal feedback is that Everything here is a voltage signal, right? It's a signal diagram. It's not a circuit diagram. And this kind of, in some ways, the difference between a mathematician and a circuit person. A mathematician can say, okay, these are all signals. I just draw, I can analyze these complicated, you know, loops, and I can write lots of equations, and I can make sure it's stable, and I'm fine. But if you're a circuit person, what's wrong with this picture? Well, I just. I just said it. Uh, there's no currents, right? There's no impedances. Somebody mentioned DC, right? There's no biasing. Uh, what's another problem with this circuit diagram? Think about the OTA we just studied. Loading. Loading. Yeah, that's those are the impedances, right? Michael? The OTA has a current output, and we need a, basically a voltage input. Yeah, so again, that's the problem that the currents and voltages are all abstracted away into signals, right? Anybody else 
have a distaste for this. <laughs> Too simple. What else is missing? Voltage reference? Yeah, there's no reference, right? Everything is referenced to some arbitrary terminal that's not present. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. There are no boundaries on low and high end? Yeah, good point. There's no saturation, right? You, you can have a 10 terabolts at the output and it's still happening, right? Which, and also, it's linear, right? This is a linearized circuit die. I mean, this is a linear representation of what we've just observed to be a highly nonlinear uh, building block, right? Okay, and of course, you guys all know why we use feedback. We use feedback because it lets us form a very precise gain, which is just a function of the feedback elements, which are usually passive elements and usually ratios even if, if they're not very precise passive elements, the feedback factor is usually a ratio of those. And so the ratio tends to track very well over process and temperature. And so the gain of the overall amplifier is only a function of this feedback factor if the loop gain is large enough. This forward gain, all it needs to do is be high enough, right? I might say the gain needs to be 1,000. You can get it to 10,000, great. But all I care about is 1,000. That's great because now over process and temperature, this gain can vary considerably, and the overall gain of the amplifier will vary very little. Uh, what are some other advantages of using feedback? This is actually uh, something you'll see in, in textbooks, and I want to challenge you guys and see what you guys think about this. So, if you, any textbook you read, they mention the advantages of feedback, they talk about desensitization, right, so now the gain is not a function of the loop gain. But they also talk about bandwidth. They say feedback is, gives you a wider, band, wider bandwidth amplifier. Is that true? If you want to use a mic. So it's a lower gain but higher bandwidth, so it's, it's, a, it's a linear trade-off, so it's okay, but unusual. Well, let, let, let's just kind of try to do an apples to apples comparison. Let's say you need a gain of 100, and you can use a closed loop amplifier and open loop amplifier. Which do you think will have a better bandwidth? Depending on how many poles you have. So if it's a single pole, it'll be times 10. Um, for example, if you have an open loop of 1,000, you have times 10 more bandwidth. Mm -hmm. I guess maybe somebody else could, could address you. You're right, but uh, I just want to get someone to say yes or no. The bandwidth is better or worse in feedback, and why? Anybody? Yes. Uh, it seems like it will be worse because the feedback network is going to introduce more capacitance to your output, which is usually the dominant node. Yeah, I think, you know, you have to challenge the, the, what you read in textbooks. Textbooks tell you, yeah, feedback makes your amplifier broader bandwidth, it's the gain bandwidth product that we've been talking about. Uh, but remember, when you design your, your amplifier for feedback configuration, you purposely compensate the hell out of it so it has a very small bandwidth, right? You better get that bandwidth back if you put feedback around it, otherwise your amplifier is unusable. So if you weren't going to use feedback in the first place, probably you could get easily get the same amount of bandwidth that you would get in closed loop configuration. In fact, maybe more because you're not worried about stability issues. So when you use feedback, you're so worried about stability that you're going to compensate it to such a low frequency so that by the time you get to unity gain, you're you're still far from the second pole, right? But if I'm using open loop, I don't care if I hit the second pole, right? I don't care if I hit the fifth pole. There's no feedback. Well, eventually I worry because there's always parasitic feedback, and that'll kill me. But clearly, feedback will broadband an amplifier that's already been debroadbanded by, by compensation, right? Okay. Uh, okay, I'll skip this example. Okay, so again, it, it seems like, and this is this was what I, I, I talked to a few of you, and this is the feedback I got, is that a lot of you have not studied uh, two-port analysis in, in, in detail. So we're going to do a quick review. 
Okay, the idea of, of, of two-port analysis is that I can decompose my amplifier into kind of a forward path, and as we discussed already, we kind of labeled that with a triangle. It's almost a unilateral amplifier, meaning the signal likes to go in this direction, and a feedback path. And the feedback is actually probably bilateral. It's going to be with passive elements. So it not only feeds a signal back, but it also feeds a signal forward. And we're going to look at that imp the implications of that in this class. And the key to using two-port analysis is to identify how the feedback is connected at each port. So here it's very clear that I'm actually breaking the output and connecting something in series with it, right? And here it's very clear that I'm just connecting something in parallel with the input. So this is where the terminology for feedback comes from. If the feedback is connected in shunt with the input, we say it's shunt feedback at the input. If it's connected in series with the output, we say it's series at the output. So this would be shunt series feedback. Okay. Well, if it's series, what is it measuring? It's measuring the current at the output, right? So it's detecting what the output current is. And if it's shunt with the input, what is it measuring? What is it forcing? What is it feeding back? Somebody? Current, right. So, so I'm actually going in series. So this is my feedback network. I'm kind of detecting this current. Ideally, I, if I could put a short, that would be really nice because I wouldn't load this amplifier at all. This is my amplifier. Hopefully, it's unilateral. And then I bring an input signal and shunt. That means that what I'm doing is sending a feedback current so that the input current of the amplifier now is the source current plus the feedback current, right? And of course, if this feedback is negative of the output voltage, then it's actually negative feedback. It subtracts from the input. So here it's in shunt. Here it's in series. And so we say this is shunt series feedback. Or if you like a more physical name, you, you might say this is current feedback at the input. And it's current detection at the output. right? So you would call this a current current feedback. And then it would, it's very obvious that what you're doing is using this in a, in a current amplification mode. So what you care about is the output current divided by the source current. Okay. Now this classification, there, there's no reason why I have to use a current source to drive this, right? I could drive this to the voltage source. Why is it, though, that we usually like to think of this as a system driven by a current source? Some might, it might even seem artificial to you, right, that, you know, we usually don't have current sources. We usually have voltage sources. And yet, when we use shunt series feedback, we kind of insist that the source is a current. Why is that? We can always convert the voltage source to the current source. Ah, yeah, sure. We can convert back and forth. But why is it that we like to think of this as a current amplifier? Yes. It fits into the earlier picture that you drew where you have a summing thing. So whatever you're feeding back to the exact same unit that you're summing. Yeah, that, that's actually a very good, good point. Uh, we're actually summing currents, right? When I connect things in shunt, I'm summing current. So if I like this picture, right? Eventually, I'm trying to design a system that kind of approximates this picture. The summing at the input requires a current input, right? If I put a voltage here, a voltage source, then I'm forcing the input voltage. And the feedback has no effect on the input voltage. So that would completely mess up the feedback. So if I drove this with a voltage with zero impedance, then this picture would be invalid. 
there would be no feedback. Okay, but what if I drive it with a voltage source of finite impedance? Then, as Shiji points out, I can just do a Norton transformation, and now it looks like I have a current source driving it. But why is it that I like to see a current source driving it? Your reason is very valid, but I'd like to get someone else to come in here. This will have a low input impedance, so it seems more natural to have a current input. That's right. That's very good. So the action of the feedback, as you know, is to lower the input impedance by 1 plus the loop gain. So this has a very low input impedance. And if I drive it with a current source, so what, what's a property of a good amplifier? Let me backtrack a little bit. So here's a, another question. If I tell you this is a good amplifier, if I tell you this is a good voltage amplifier, what does that mean? This is like electronics 40, right? The first class you ever took in electronics. But it's good to go back and rethink these things. So what's a good property of a voltage amplifier? Yes? Infinite input impedance and zero output impedance. Well, what does that give you? All of your signal makes it into the amplifier and doesn't divide out over your source. That's right. So if I tell you that this is a good voltage amplifier, that means the voltage gain does not depend on RS or RL. If it's a good voltage amplifier, right? If I put in RL of 10 ohms and drive it with 1K ohm, and I tell you the voltage gain is 10, and it's a very good voltage amplifier, you'll get a gain of 10. If now I drive it with a mega ohm and put here 0.1 ohms, I still should get 10 if it's a good voltage amplifier, right? Now, you know all real circuits are very sensitive to these things, right? If I all of a sudden do this, it's crazy, right? The gain is going to drop. Well, that's the nice thing about feedback. So if I tell you that the feedback configuration is raising the input impedance and lowering the output impedance, it tells you that it's moving you closer to this ideal so that you actually do get a gain that's largely independent of the source and load impedance. And so in this case, if I were to drive this with a voltage source, then the gain would be a strong function of the source impedance, right? Because the input current, because the input impedance looking into here is almost zero by the action of the feedback, so then the input current would be Vn over Rs. And then that means that the output current would be some, some gain times the input current. So the overall transfer function would be a function of RS. Now, in many applications, there's nothing wrong with that, right? RS is a fixed quantity. I know what it is. It's 50 ohms or it's 300 ohms. Great. That's my trans resistance is a kilo ohm, so I'm going to get good, good voltage gain out of my system. But in other applications, if you're selling this to somebody and saying this is a good amplifier, and you tell them it's a good current amplifier, right, then what you're telling them is that it, independent of the source and load impedance, if you drive it as a current, you will get the same current gain. Okay? All right, so a little bit of a diversion just to get you guys to think a little bit about the feedback stuff. All right, so now <clears throat> this is something we, we discussed in 142, and uh, so I'll probably go a little bit fast here so I don't bore everybody. Uh, but if, if you have questions about this, uh, I encourage you to, to come to office hours and to, to read Chapter 8 of Brain Meyer. Okay, so the idea is that I want to analyze this amplifier, and I recognize that there's some feedback. It's not too hard to recognize that there is feedback. It's more difficult to recognize what kind of feedback there is. And because any time you have the output connected back to the input, there's some feedback, right? And there's certainly lots of parasitic feedback, like CMU. Uh, sometimes it's not so clear that there's feedback, right? I mean, if you guys had never taken an electronics course and somebody showed you a degenerated amplifier, would you realize that that's feedback? It's not, not that obvious. I certainly didn't when I first saw it. All right, so the... So the idea is that I want to somehow identify the feedback and the amplifier. And here, it's pretty clear that this RF, despite its labeling, is, 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 is the feedback, right? And so it looks like I have an amplifier, and in shunt, I connect with it another element. 
So here, if I draw a picture, I have my amp. And my feedback in this case is almost trivial. But if I think of my amplifier reference to ground, then it looks like I have something just connected in shunt. Okay? And that means that I'm summing input currents and summing output currents, right? So because I've connected everything in shunt, the actual current going into the amplifier is a sum of these two currents. And the current coming out of the amplifier is also a sum, or in this case, actually a sum, if I label it correctly, is also a sum of the currents going here and here. So what I really like to do is characterize this amplifier in such a way so that I can sum currents at the input and the output. Okay. Now, this amplifier is a two-port. I have basically four terminals, right? I have four terminals which give me two ports. That means I can define an input voltage, an input current, an output voltage, and an output current. And believe it or not, with electromagnetics, you can prove that only two of these are actually independent. So I have these four numbers here, and this is a if this is a linear circuit, so this is basically a linear version of my amplifier, then all four numbers cannot be independent. Any two numbers can always therefore be written as a linear combination of the other two numbers, right? And so I'm really free when I'm doing, doing two-port analysis to pick two of them to be independent, and then I can express all my voltages and currents in my system as a function of those two. Now, if I'm going to sum currents at the input and output, what's a good choice? Current's a good choice, right? So what I'd like to do is kind of express I'd like to use my what we call the admittance parameters, or also known as the Y parameters, because the Y parameters give me the input current as a function of input and output voltage. And the input and output voltage is the same for both the amplifier and the feedback element. Okay? So that means if I connect them in parallel, so let me write an equation. Let's call Let's call this I1, V1, I2, V2. Let's call this I3. And let's call this I4. Okay, And you'll notice that this is also V1, and this is also V2, because they're connected in parallel. So if I want to write an equation, so I would write I1, I2 is Y parameters of the amplifier times V1, V2. I can also write that I3, I4 is the Y parameters of the feedback element times V1, V2. Okay? And if I sum these equations, I'll get I1 plus I3, I2 plus I4 is Y of the amplifier plus Y of the feedback times V1, V2. Okay? Now, why am I so excited? Well, I'm excited because I've summed the currents, and that's actually the input current, and that's actually the output current, right? The sum of I1 and I3 is the input current, and the sum of I2 and I4 is the output current. And V1 is the input voltage, and V2 is the output voltage. So I can write here that Y amp plus Y feedback is V in, V out. Okay. So this is why Y parameters made sense in this particular application, because by simply summing the two port parameters of the amplifier and the feedback network, I can describe the overall system. Okay. Now, this is one example. You can now design three other examples, which again work out perfectly like this. So it could be a current amplifier, a voltage amplifier, a trans-resistance amplifier, or a trans-admittance amplifier. Right? And those are the four cases. You have four variables. You can choose two. Right? 
So you get four different combinations. Any questions about this? Okay, good. Hopefully it's a review. All right, so what are the Y parameters? Well, if you ever forget, don't ever memorize how to calculate H21 or G12. Just write down a simple equation, right? Write down I1 is Y11 V1 plus Y12 V2. So if I need to calculate Y11, that's the ratio of I1 over V1 when V2 is equal to 0. Likewise, uh, I2 is Y21 V1 plus Y22 V2. Just write these two equations down, and these equations just pop, pop right out. If I want to calculate Y21, that's also equal to I2 over V1 when V2 is equal to 0. That means I take my two port, short it, right? So V2 is equal to 0. I calculate the input admittance for a short at the output, and that's equal to Y11. I calculate my transconductance, right? I apply voltage at the input, I measure the output current. So GM which is I out over V in is equal to Y21. Right? Do the same thing, short the input, and you get the reverse transconductance and the output admittance for the input shorted. Okay? So the, these uh, parameters are not mysterious, and you definitely shouldn't memorize them. Uh, you should just work them out. Right? It doesn't take very long to. And if you work with them long enough, you start to memorize them, actually. You start to just remember what they are. Uh, you don't need to memorize them. The one interesting point is if you look at these equations, if the amplifier were unilateral, right? Unilateral means that the, that the output only depends on the input, right? Not the other way around. So if I look at this equation, uh, in particular this term, this term is telling me that the input is a function of the output. And that's actually bad, right? If the amplifier were unilateral, the output should not influence the input, right? That's why we draw it as a triangle. The signal flow is only in this direction, not in, in this direction. So that means that this term should have to equal to 0. So y12 is equal to 0 for a unilateral amplifier. Questions? Comments? All right, so again, I don't want to bore everybody, so I'll just go through these slides, and uh, you can go through them more slowly if you need to. Uh, I need to derive a couple of equations, and these are actually something we derived in 142. So first of all, I'd like to derive the input and output admittance as a function of load. In other words, I'm going to put YL here and YS. And I'd like to know, for instance, what's the Y in looking into the two port, right? Or I'd like to calculate what Y out is. And this is very easily done. A few lines of algebra, and this is the result you get. You find that Y in is Y11, not surprisingly, the input admittance when the output is shorted, plus an extra term which depends on the load. Right Now, if this amplifier were unilateral, the input should not depend on the output. So you would expect that independent of the load, the input admittance would be a constant. So if we calculate the load when the, when we calculate the input admittance when the load is a short, that should be the same input admittance that we calculate for any load, right? In which case, that would tell you for a unilateral amplifier, y in should just equal to y11. And indeed, if you set y12 equal to 0, this term goes away, and you just get y11. Okay? And this equation is symmetric. You can just replace the index 1 and 2, and you get y out for free. Okay? Questions? In particular, for those of you who haven't taken 142, if you feel like we're going too fast, just slow me down. Otherwise, I'll speed through this. Okay. Uh, how about the voltage gain? Now we're getting a little bit interesting. Uh, I'm going to calculate the voltage gain 
of the overall amplifier, right? So, so this is any two port described by Y parameters. And I'm going to now calculate the voltage gain at the load with respect to the source. And again, I'm not going to bore you and, and do all the algebra, but this is the answer you get. Okay. So the answer you get, first of all, is a function of source and load impedance and a function of the two port parameters. Just to convince you that this equation is not as foreign as you might think, let's, uh, let's actually analyze it for a very simple case. Okay, so this is the equation. This is the voltage gain. And let's apply it to probably the world's simplest example. A low frequency transistor. And let's assume that, so in fact, at low frequencies, what are the two port parameters of this guy? What's Y11? Remember, Y11 is the input admittance when I short the output. And let's go to DC. Zero, right? There is no conductance connected between here. It's just a capacitance, which is an open circuit, right? And so if you like, you could say it's J omega CGS plus C gate to drain, which approaches zero at very low frequency, right? Okay. What's Y22? Remember, Y22 is the output admittance when you short the input. So if I short the input, what do I see looking to the output? R0. Yeah, 1 over R0, which is almost 0, right? If R0 is large. Okay, what's Y21? Remember, Y21 is the output current as a function of input voltage. Yeah, it's just the GM of the transistor, right? And then Y12 uh, is the feedback. What's the feedback in this case? for a simple transistor model. It's zero, right? It's it's on the order of, let's just say, it goes like J omega C gate to drain, right? Because of the feedback that occurs through here. But we're saying it's low frequency, so this goes to zero as well. All right? So now if we apply this equation, this equation tells us that the voltage gain is minus YS, Y21, which is GM, Ys plus Y11, Y11 is 0. Yl plus Y22, which is 0, minus something that's 0 anyway. Ys cancels out, so I get minus Gm times Zl. Right? That's a very familiar result. Okay. Now, what's kind of cool is if you go back to this general equation, and you stare at this a while, you'll, you'll notice that all the feedback is really occurring due to Y12. If Y12 were equal to zero for the overall amplifier, right, not just the amplifier, but the amplifier with the feedback, then that would kind of be the gain without feedback, right? So I'm going to just define, I'm going to say that if my system were unilateral, the gain would just be this without this term. Okay? And so then I have this, let's call this AVU, the unilateralized voltage gain. Okay? It's, all it is is the general voltage gain with the feedback explicitly removed. So now I take my general equation and I just divide the numerator and denominator by this term here. Ys plus Y11, Yl plus Y1, Y22. So over here, if you you know again, I maybe I just do it to make it clear. So let's go back to paper. Um, so all I'm going to do is divide the numerator and denominator by this term. 
So this goes away and I get 1. Here I get ys plus y11, yl plus y22. And here I get ys, y11, yl plus y22. Okay. So then the, the voltage gain, I can write it as an expression minus ys, y21 divided by this term, 1 minus y12, y21 divided by that term. Okay. Let's go back to the slide. If you stare at this for a while, you'll re recognize that the numerator is just the voltage gain, is just that unilateral voltage gain. Okay. And that means that if you interpret this system as a standard feedback system where the closed loop voltage gain is the open loop voltage gain divided by the loop gain, then that means that this term here is actually the loop gain. Okay? And that's that's actually a very powerful result because as we'll talk about next lecture, loop gain is really the most important thing in designing amplifiers. Okay. I'll stop there.